Thank you for all the organizers and for inviting me to this. Um, this has been such a lovely occasion for the last two days. I want to thank you all for this. I want to tell you about one line of activity that has gone on for 50 years that was inspired more than 50 years ago here at Utah. And that is going from Ivan's pioneering 1968 head mounted display to work still going on today on realizing this in one's ordinary eyeglasses. So just to make sure you understand what I'm talking about here, here is a picture from the New York Times article a couple of years ago when Facebook changed its name to Meta. I think that's really significant. By the way, I have no financial interest in Meta. I don't own any stock in Meta. I have some friends, but when a company or an individual changes its name, it's a big deal. When Cassius Clay changed his name to Muhammad Ali. Ali, it's a big deal. It's saying to the world, I am something new now. And so my take on it, when Facebook changed its name to Meta, that was a really big deal. And this was the picture that was in the New York Times that day that Meta supplied. Here are two guys playing chess, and one of them is not there. I think that's a great vision. What does it take to realize that vision? And here I've drawn over it my understanding of what it takes to realize that vision. Okay? So let's look at the guy on the left. Can you see this cursor, by the way? I mean, I don't want to pick up my laser pointer because then the people in Zoom land, you know, can't see that. Okay, so here's a guy. He's wearing glasses, his regular glasses, and there's a display in them, presumably so he could see his partner across the table, right? Now, what does it take to put something on display? It takes an image generator, a graphic system, and it needs a head tracker to know which way he's looking, right? And in order to see his partner, who's not really there, there needs to be some cameras or some other kind of sensors where his partner is that creates a 3D model of his partner, sends it through the network into the image generator for this guy on the left. Everybody with me? And we need the same thing, of course. This is symmetric, so the guy on the right sees the guy on the left. And by the way, of course, we probably want to see more than the guy. We want to see the beautiful street around it, but that's uh, icing on the cake. All right? So let's think about what it takes to do that from a technology standpoint. First of all, this needs to be an eyeglasses form factor, okay? This is not going to be in a HoloLens 2. It's not going to be in a Quest. It's not even going to be in a Google Glass, right? It needs to be in the guy's eyeglasses, nothing else. And it can't be something that he takes out from his satchel and puts it on, right? So it needs to be in his eyeglasses. It needs to have a wide field of view. It can't be one of these things where you look down and you see, oh, yeah, this is my next meeting in 30 minutes. You know, it needs to be that he could see his friend across the table, OK? It needs to have a day-long battery life because he's not going to be plugging into the wall. He's out somewhere at a cafe. And then here is, I think, most of the interesting part. Where are the cameras? They're not going to be on the street by the cafe, right? The only place they could be is what he is wearing. Think about how difficult that is. How do you get a 3D description of his partner when all you have in his partner's technology is whatever he's wearing in his glasses? Okay, so for that, what we mean is that there's going to be in these glasses some cameras, some that look forward to tell where you're looking, some looking down to figure out what your body is, some looking inside to get an idea of your face and your expressions. All of these need to work in real time. Okay? So let me remind you, those of you that weren't here this morning, how I got started in this. Were there anybody not here this morning? Oh, then I could tell you. I don't have to tell you the story. Alan Kay made his name be blessed. 
showed me Ivan's paper from 1968, and it changed my life. I mean, he showed me a lot of other papers, but you know, what is the interest in resolution theorem proving when you have a head-mounted display? <laughs> it's like worlds apart. Could I go back to my class in real analysis and not be jazzed by this idea of a 3D system that is in the room with me? That just propelled me to Utah. And that has stayed with me these 50 years. By the way, the one thing I want to tell the guy who's in the Computer History Museum and all the rest of you is that this system should not be called Sword of Damocles. I have said this to Ivan, <laughs> that it should be changed. In Wikipedia, it shouldn't be called Sword of Damocles. That was just the mechanical tracker. In some ways, the least interesting part to me. The interesting thing was the green monster. All this thing in real time. And by the way, I have it highlighted here, if you don't know, the wireless ultrasonic trans tracker. So if you look here, can you all see this picture reasonably well? This is from the picture. Do you notice that the user here is wearing a sort of a crown with three uh, things sticking out? Do you all see that if you're in the back? Those were three ultrasonic transmitters. This is all designed by Chuck Seitz. Is that right? I think Chuck Seitz. And do you all see these four things coming down from the ceiling? You know, this is the shower stall. The ends of each one of those four arms were listening devices, microphones, and each one of those listened to all three transmitters, and there was a bank of filters in back of each one of these microphones, so it could tell the distance from each one of these three transmitters. So each microphone output three values the distance to that microphone of each one of the three transmitters. Therefore, 12 numbers, you figure out the six degrees of freedom. Is that brilliant? And by the way, Ivan said it, and Chuck said too, that it was sort of unreliable because the heating system at Harvard, you know, when it blew hot air, you know, they didn't have temperature compensation and the speed of sound in air is a function of temperature and therefore it hiccuped when the heat went on. So they built this mechanical tracker. But to me, what's so exciting is a wireless ultrasonic tracker. So I wanted to put in a plug for how, Im what an impression Utah created for me all kinds of times. And one of those moments was a year after I took uh, Henri's and then Ivan's graphics class, I was checking my mail in the mailboxes and I saw this scene of people measuring the Volkswagen. You could probably tell of certain people here. Uh, Jim Clark, Butong Fong, uh, Robert McDermott, various other people, okay? And I was looking at this scene shaking my head, Ivan comes by to the mail room, he's checking, you know, taking out his physical mail. And I say to Ivan, you know, this is really mean and cruel. <laughs> what do you mean, he says. I said, it's mean and cruel of you to make your students physically measure this three-dimensional object because surely we could think of a better way to do that. So says Ivan, that might be the case but while you and I are chatting idly, these guys are getting some real results. <laughs> oh, and, he says, you might want to go down and help them. <laughs> I felt so uh, embarrassed by this that I actually went down and helped them for a minimum amount of time just to assuage my guilt. Uh, if you really want to know, uh, this thing on the right by Butong Fong, um, the turn signal, I think I helped measure the turn signal. That was the least I could do, okay? <laughs> and so if ever you see the turn signal and it sort of looks okay, I think I contributed a few minutes to it, okay? But what this got me interested in is this problem of how do you automatically construct a three-dimensional object? And shortly thereafter, 
uh, we had a visitor from Stanford who talked about Shaky the robot having a laser rangefinder on it. And I thought, aha, this is the way to do this. So I went to Ivan, I said, you know, if we just have a laser rangefinder and then we move it, you know, we could scan it, get a whole picture, what we would get is a depth image, right? And then we could move this thing and get a depth image from another place. We could put all these together and we could run sort of like a Watkins visible surface algorithm backwards. Because what is the Watkins algorithm but a scan line oriented thing that at each line figures out what's visible, right? I mean, the color is an afterthought, but what you want to do is what's visible. So basically, the output is a depth map. And now, if we just had multiple depth maps, we could then do the sort, and we could have a plane. You know, what do we see at 3D objects on top? And then we could do, you know, something around it to construct a few lines, and then the next scan line, and a, a few lines, and then we could put a skin over it of polygons or whatever, and then we have a 3D object. I even said, yeah. That should work. <laughs> I thought it was great. Then I went to the next person to have on my committee, Elliot Organic. Some people remember Elliot was a great guy. He wrote 19 books or whatever. And I then understood why he was so successful writing 19 books. Now, I, to be sure, Elliot Organic was not in computer graphics, but I had taken classes with him. I knew he was a great writer. He really could integrate a lot of things. I give him the same pitch the same pitch I gave to Ivan in 30 seconds, and Ivan signed up for the committee. Elliot stops me after the first sentence. Okay, what do you mean 3D objects? <laughs> I say that, okay, now, now, what do you mean by a range finder? <laughs> okay, now, what do you mean by a visible surface algorithm? So, half hour later, he says, that should work. <laughs> <laughs> and what you see here is a laser range finder whose funding Dave Evans found for me. Of course, this was not a project of anything, but Dave Evans uh, gave me $2,000, which was enough to buy uh, a laser and galvanometers and controllers and uh, digital to analog converters and to use Bob Burton's Twinkle Box, which some of you may remember uh, was used as a spinning disc to digitize like LEDs. Uh, he claimed I may have been the only one to use it for a long time. But that's because, as we were saying here, the thing heated up like after 30 minutes. Do I recall this correctly? <laughs> and so this is one of the objects. Um, should I say this is uh, crude enough so you probably cannot tell the gender of the person lying on the ground, right? It was one of my friends. And so <laughs> one of the things that came out of that what positive and negative was, positive was, I got this dissertation. The negative was, nobody ever mentioned to me about publication. It was like, why would I want to publish something? I just built a system and, you know, it worked, right? And it wasn't until a year later that my old uh, dissertation advisor, Bob Plummer, sent me a similar paper from IBM that I realized in reading it, they made one tiny mistake. And by combining it with the algorithm, you know, that resulted in uh, this thing with the person lying on the ground, you could do much better. And so this uh, cover of Communications the ACM is the optimum surface of a CT scan of a human person being who was scanned. Optimum in the sense of the minimum total surface area of triangles that fit all the data points. So, <laughs> this is too small to read, but I wanted to give you some idea of how inspiring this idea of Ivan's was. So, here are a few of the papers we've um, worked on and published on the display system itself. Um, the latest one came out in SIGGRAPH last year, and it goes back through the years to uh, 1998 with a video see-through headset and a whole bunch of other ones I didn't have time to put. We worked on trackers from 1977 to 2019, the latest one going at like 50 kilohertz so that it could measure small tremors 
of somebody wearing it. We worked on image generation system from uh, binary space partitioning trees that Bob Schumacher, where you see now, uh, Bob was instrumental in inspiring. There was this uh, paper from some project that Bob and Rod and others did at GE about uh, how you could do separating planes and uh, do priority ordering of polygons that I didn't understand very well and Bob helped explain it to me and that led to um, this algorithm which I only years later found out uh, enabled uh, first person video shooter games which I don't care for a lot so I didn't know about it till many years later but I'm told that if you uh, use Doom or Quake or things like that on your PC underneath it all it's the binary space partitioning tree algorithm. And we've been working on image generation uh, for low latency until, you know, for all these various activities. Finally, model generation, we're still working on, and we worked on from the surface reconstruction work to this very moment, there's some student trying to get a paper finished for uh, the Neural Information Processing Society paper. So this inspired a lot of our interest. I want to mention like three of them just to give you some flavor. 1984, Gary Bishop's tracker was I think the first one that did not the usual thing of having cameras around the corners of the room and looking at the light say on the head, but going the other way of having some smart sensors on the head and looking at how the room changed as you move. Uh, here is um, the chip from that. And some of you mentioned about how um, enabling MOSIS was, uh, the MOS implementation system, is that the number? But we used it a lot. And it enabled us to do things like, in this chip, they were a whole lot of optical sensors and processing right behind it in order to be able to operate at kilohertz rates in 1984. I'll give you one more, I'll give you two more uh, Topics. One is early telepresence systems, which used a sea of cameras that would be all around. Here was the concept drawing for a remote surgical consultant who would be wearing a headset and would see the patient and the local medical personnel. And we recognized um, a real-time version of this with friends at UPenn and friends at Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, which took 27 video streams. This was at the 2002 Supercomputing Conference. Took them over the internet too and let you see in another booth a 3D rendering of whatever is in that booth. I'll give you one last one. Here is one that used AR to look inside the tumor inside a patient. So instead of watching the video screen on your ultrasound, in your headset, you would see your hand. Of course, this is uh, Etta Paisano, head of breast imaging, and she sees the tumor right here inside the patient's breast. And that called for, by the way, making custom head-mounted display that had very narrow field of view and that had the optical center of the camera be at the optical center of the eye so that there's proper hand-eye coordination. Here's the last thing I want to show you about. So you know I was saying that I think one of the really difficult challenges, how do you get the 3D reconstruction of a person from nothing but what that person is wearing? So here is paper from two years ago. Here's the student who is interested in soccer and runs back and forth uh, in the backyard of his apartment house. And the only thing that we're using is whatever is on his head, namely a couple of cameras and motion sensors that are on his wrist and on his feet. So what that allows us to do, we think, is to think about how this could be useful for people who have certain kinds of uh, diseases that go on for a very long time that, like Parkinson's disease, does not have any cure right now, but what, pay, what doctors really need is to understand how they're doing on their current medication. And so what we have recently started is a reasonably large project that based on this assumption of having a, an AR 
uh, headset and display in your glasses so that the patient could wear them like he wears his regular eyeglasses all day and so could wear them when he's with the doctor, could also wear them when he's doing exercises and could also wear them when he is walking around in his home and then could review all these with his physician. So, very similar requirements for everybody in AR glasses, but something that may be helpful to people in the near term. So, in my last slide, my takeaway on the Utah inspiration was that we have a vision and we make it happen with whatever it takes. No boundaries between hardware and software. There's no boundaries between optics and algorithms. No boundaries between mechanicals. And this carried on for years later. When I have a problem and I call Rich Riesenfeld or Lane Cohen, we're thinking about a um, new kind of a tracking system that needs a complicated duo hexadecimal kind of thing. Uh, we don't know quite how to make a prototype of it, the answer would be, oh, why don't we just make the real thing? And that's what they would do. They'd make the real thing that still works for years and years later. Okay, no boundaries. And the realization is the reward, not the paper. The paper is merely a report of what we have done. It's not an end in itself. And what I remember is inspiring examples everywhere around. I mean, there was Ivan's HMD you know, sitting there, hanging there. There was Watkins, the Watkins box that took in polygons and output video. How crazy is that? This was at a time, by the way, when we didn't have a frame buffer yet. The thing outputs video in real time. Of course, only of whatever number of triangles you happen to have, but in real time. There were just the Twinkle box, there were two PDP-10s, there was Chuck Seitz Hardware Lab. I mean, I just can go on and on. Um, and finally, there was this friendly, cooperative atmosphere. I can't tell you the number of times somebody would help me. I'm doing something, and I don't know, Lance Williams says, you know, we could do this a little better. <laughs> and we would do that. And so that's what has stayed with me for 50 years and counting, is that kind of experience, for which I thank you. <laughs>